Welcome to this panel about the streaming success in Norway. As you may know, um, the Norwegian music market is in a unique position globally because we are one of the few places in the world where actually the uh, digital revenue has surpassed the physical revenue. Today in uh, Norway, uh, streaming actually uh, generates more than 65% of uh, the revenue, while CDs only represent 10%. Uh, our panel today is, um, <clears throat> uh, will take a closer look at the key factors behind the spread of streaming in Norway and see if these experiences uh, can be transferable to the rest of Europe and maybe the rest of the world. Uh, we will also try to uh, take a closer look uh, into the future and see what's ahead for the digital music model in general. My name is uh, Cecilia Skir. I work as um, a writer. Uh, I write about music and technology in one of the biggest papers in Norway, Aftenposten. And I'm also a musician for 15 years. Um, if you can call being a drummer in a rock band and musician, I don't know. <laughs> um, I will now let the um, panel introduce themselves. Yeah, I can start. Trond is my name. Uh, I work as uh, the marketing manager of uh, the biggest indie distribution for digital distribution in the Nordics. And uh, when we say digital distribution in the Nordics, um, we will learn through these uh, minutes that Digital is a big, big part of the, con uh, consuming, uh, the com consuming, sorry, our music. And uh, yeah. we've been from the start, uh, when it was zero money, going up to where it is now. So Phonofile is the name of that company. Hello, my name is uh, Sveinung Rindal, and I'm uh, head of editorial in the Norwegian streaming service Vimp, that we also have here in Germany. Uh, I worked with WIMP since uh, 2009, and uh, long before that I was uh, working in a record store, and I have been working in a distribution company for physical CDs and vinyls. So uh, I have a musical background, uh, with which includes both physical and digital products. Guten Tag, uh, or guten Morgen for some of you. Um, my name is Arndt Måse, Arndt Maso. I'm an associate professor at the University of Oslo, uh, and there I uh, work on a big research project called Clouds and Concerts, uh, where we study both live music, the concerts part, and why people are so uh, attached and uh, get so much uh, out of live music. And then the other part, the Clouds part, which I'm running, is about music streaming and new ways of uh, uh, using music. And we have been uh, fortunate enough to get access to anonymized uh, data logs from WIMP streaming music service. So we have millions and millions of tracks uh, or uh, streams that we have been studying how people use uh, streaming since 2010 when lo uh, WIMP launched. And until um, last year, about this time, we got the last data batch and we're working on, on kind of uh, analyze, anal analyzing and writing about the, this uh, as well now. And I also have a background as a musician and used to hang around with some of the people that uh, used to, to, um, to, to be with us musicians, such as drummers uh, and uh, yeah. <laughs> we like drummers. Uh, first question goes out to Sveinung. How will you describe the evolution of music streaming that we have experienced in Norway in just a few years? And what do you think are the key factors to this success? Well, uh, let's start uh, in the middle of the 2000s. Uh, around the 2004 and five. I think we saw a fall in the CD sale, which was quite drastic. Uh, Download was uh, launched uh, through iTunes uh, Music Store in Norway in 2004, I think. And, um, um, and the fall in the CD uh, 
uh, market was uh, so big already when we launched streaming in 2009. Uh, I must say that Spotify launched in 2008, so uh, we were quite tight, but uh, um, it was a product that uh, people really wanted. It was uh, convenient and it was new, fresh, and uh, um, everyone was kind of skeptical to these new streaming services in the beginning, but they were also a bit hopeful uh, because the fall was already very visible. Uh, what we have seen the last uh, uh, five years is that uh, the curves are now going up again, and uh, I think uh, we saw on the curve uh, a bit earlier today that uh, uh, the total consume of uh, recorded music today is uh, about matching the 2005 levels. So uh, instead of falling, we're now on the way up. And that, uh, I mean, that's uh, why we're here, to sit and discuss uh, the successful factors. Uh, Trun, uh, could you say something about the big turning point? Yeah. Um, well, uh, in Norway, as different to uh, our neighbor country, Sweden, we had a quite healthy starting up download sales, like the, um, the physical store that Sveinung used to work with, called uh, the Plato Company, went into a download store, and, uh, and uh, it was kind of taking care of the same market, and people had um, um, high penetration of... Uh, broadband, they would sit online and download legally. That happened in Norway. In Sweden, it was piracy. Uh, so there you had Pirate Bay and um, not very much music sales. So what we feared in Norway was that streaming would come and cannibalize the download market we already had. And um, everyone, including the digital industry, was really afraid of what was going to happen when something came. But it was like going out and you need to try this product because it appealed so much to the end user. And also the artists started calling and said, we want to be on streaming services. Uh, so we said, okay, let's give it a try and see what happens. And uh, to, our, to our amazement, it didn't really cannibalize at all the download sales, but it started growing quite slowly until it came on the phone. And then something happened because then people started paying for the subscriptions in, to a much larger degree and they also started using music much more. So we could see a steep curve going up after the introduction of the Spotify app in iPhone. And um, everyone being to Norway, they, they would know that if, if, um, if you're on a tram, for instance, and a phone calls, usually it is the sound of an iPhone. So that penetration has been long in, in Norway. And that was a huge factor to the turning point, which is for us, for our numbers in Phonofile, you could see in March 2011 that streaming were surpassing the uh, numbers uh, coming in for downloading. And for us, that was a really good day because then we could see that if download continues to be uh, okay and good business and streaming continue to grow, then we actually have more than one leg to stand on. And that's what we have today. Arndt, do you want to... Um, I think uh, we saw the same thing as Phonofile uh, said in 2011 uh, for the whole market in Norway, that uh, about during the summer of 2011, the two kind of curves crossed. And, uh, and also it's very interesting from our point of view when we looked at the streaming data that uh, now the uh, uh, the phone, not only the iPhone, but uh, the smartphones uh, are much higher than uh, than uh, other ways of accessing music through streaming. So now, the last year, uh, the uh, about 64 percent of all streams came from a phone. I'm not sure what it is today because I don't have the numbers for 2014. But my guess would be that maybe it's 70 percent, something like that. Uh, because uh, it's also a lot of people using uh, regular PCs or Macs during daytime, especially when they're at work. Uh, a lot of people listen through he headphones, and we see a curve uh, 
both during kind of lunch hours or, or uh, after lunch hours, and then um, more uh, with mobile phones uh, when they are commuting or even in the evening when they have a more kind of lean back uh, mode, but with a lot of listening through iPhones or iPads and even streaming to Apple TVs and, and those things. So I think the, as Trun said, I think the mobile phone was a very important uh, factor in spreading it and, and, and uh, seeing that people use uh, music throughout the day uh, in everyday life because they always have their phone with them. Just one, one little thing I want to mention there. I talked to someone uh, working in a big company, a corporate company, and they said after the open office trend hit them, everyone would sit with headphones to not be disturbed by everyone else, and they would play music very much during the day. So trends like that might also contribute to what we see today. But how much of this uh, success in Norway um, is connected to unique factors for the Norwegian audience and the Norwegian music market? Ant? Maybe I could say some more about that. I think uh, both Sweden and, uh, and Norway have a lot of factors that are important to make it uh, possible, like uh, broadband penetration, uh, high penetration on mo mobile phones, uh, it's a big middle class that can afford to pay either a subscription or uh, pay for music. But also I think a factor that not, is not that obvious, uh, which is trust. It's a, both societies are kind of what we call high trust societies, which means that it's uh, easy to, um, people are willing to, to give their credit card to a company, they trust uh, uh, that they're not being uh, kind of misused. Uh, uh, there are fairly strict privacy laws in Norway, so uh, you wouldn't get bombarded with uh, uh, spam from, say, WIMP or Spotify just because you gave your credit card away or your personal information away. Uh, I know a guy in, sitting in the middle here, Espen, who launched uh, an app here in Berlin, said that he, he was kind of worried uh, when he was doing a beta testing because his users in beta testing would turn off their mobile phones during night or just re, uh, uh, de just kind of delete his app uh, when they were not using it. Uh, so he had a hard time kind of getting user data back in order to kind of understand how to develop that service. And those things you wouldn't see at the same level in Norway because uh, people kind of have a basic trust in, in, in uh, startups or in kind of companies that try to launch something. Of course, they might not always be right, but uh, most of the time they are. Will you say that um, the economy has uh, something to say uh, as well? Uh, people have. Uh, yeah, of course. I just mentioned that in passing, yeah. but both in Sweden and Norway, we haven't been, been hit as hard as. Uh, uh, as the rest of Europe, especially Southern Europe, uh, when it comes to, to the, the uh, economic uh, uh, credit crunch uh, from 2008 and forward. But still we see, for instance, in, in Spain, they have a high, uh, high level of streaming, uh, but there they wouldn't subscribe to streaming the same way they would either um, stream from YouTube or, or, or uh, I from uh, ad-based service uh, such as Spotify. What about WIMP, um, Svanung? Did you? Um, what did you do to uh, uh, launch uh, WIMP in Norway? Did you do something special, or is it uh, something special <laughs> to target the Norwegian market? Um, I should say that we had a very big master plan, but uh, I don't think we have uh, had that. Uh, I think our plan was that uh, I was at that time hired by Plata Company to launch their MP3 store, as uh, Trond mentioned. And then when we, when we uh, launched WIMP, we were kind of in the same, uh, same thoughts of taking the old record store ID uh, into the digital service, uh, and then you have some. Then you have to question yourself: How do you, how do you replace uh, the record store clerk uh, with something in a digital service? 
And then we went into the editorial part that uh, we have been <coughs> developing for five years. Uh, and I think when you're talking about the trust, I think that was very important in Norway in the beginning from Prato Company. People had trust in the music service. Uh, and that's not transferable to new countries. So, uh, but after five years, we now have a much more uh, developed editorial ID. And I think that editorial ID is transferable. So I'm very excited to see our further uh, recruiting around the world. Uh, you also have um, a hi-fi service. Uh, do you think uh, the Norwegian market was a uh, special. This was especially good for the Norwegian market, or um? Mm, uh, uh, not exactly. I think I think we think that the <laughs> Vimp Hi-Fi initiative was even better for some other markets, like like Germany, for instance. Uh, maybe not the fact that it's uh, double try double priced. Uh, it costs. Uh, it costs um, 20 euros uh, a month. But uh, in the way that you are quality, uh, uh, you're, uh, you have a very quality um, sense in, in, uh, in Germany. And there are a lot of big hi-fi uh, stores around uh, the country and everything. So I don't think that's specially for Norway. Um, now, uh, this week, we also launched that we are releasing a new brand uh, outside uh, our existing markets in the uh, UK and US, uh, which is called Tidal. Uh, and uh, Tidal Hi-Fi will also do much of the same that we do with Wimp Hi-Fi. Uh, so that means ac actually that we believe more in the Hi-Fi uh, segment uh, than in the uh, regular segment uh, when going to new territories because we, we think that we're kind of ni niching ourselves okay. into uh, instead of doing the mainstream that we think that Spotify or Google or YouTube, other act uh, actors will do. But Hi-Fi is still uh, uh, a small segment of the streaming uh, in the total it's market. still quite Global. small, uh, but it's it's uh, growing very fast, and uh, we there's there's two things because it's double priced, so it's interesting economically both for us and for the labels and artists. But we also see that our hi-fi customers they are customers longer than the regular customers, so you have a bigger loyalty, and then. Each customer, if you don't think about the monthly rate, each customer is more valued. <laughs> and that's an important uh, knowledge that we uh, will spin off. Maybe you should just say, p people that don't know WIMP, uh, Hi-Fi is the lossless, it's a high quality uh, uh, sound uh, for the people that haven't yeah. tried it. CD quality. Yes, uh, let's uh, take a closer look at the streaming model. Um, what do you think about the model? Is it uh, perfect as it is today, or <laughs> does it need any fixing? Trum, maybe you should start. Well, uh, we really appreciate the, the effects that the streaming model has had, and uh, I think this is... Um, we talked about the consumer earlier, about um, factors that might, may, might play into why we, we um, take off on streaming in Norway and I think also we were big music fans from before we used lots of money on music we were like on the top Europe plan there but um, the streaming model as such is a good thing however there's different ways you can look at the um, distribution of money which uh, I guess Arndt will tell us a bit more about um, of the user centric model and we truly support that uh, there are different ways of seeing this but uh, streaming as such I think will be um, a dominant factor in in how music will be consumed in the foreseeable future. Um, not only in the Nordics, but I also think it will continue to roll out and grow in other markets, also in the GSA and uh, Euro European market and the US market. Maybe I could say something about that since uh, Trun uh, uh, asked me. Uh, the way I think, uh, as uh, Sveiner said, uh, uh, the revenues are growing again, it's, and it's back to a few years back, it, uh, so it, it, the money in the whole market 
is is growing and and uh, shows that it it is a uh, a better model than it would have been if we just relied on piracy and all those things. But there could still be improvements done with how that completely uh, that revenue is shared between labels and artists. And we did a study uh, last year where we. Uh, looked at the way the money is distributed now and then compared it to what we call a user-centric model. The way the money is distributed today is a so-called pro rata model, which means that if, uh, say there are two users of WIMP, and uh, you on the first uh, second row here, you stream uh, a thousand streams a month and I stream a hundred streams. Then those 1100 streams would be shared evenly between the artists that uh, we listen to. And that means that uh, if you pay 10 euro and I pay 10 euro, um, actually eight, eight of my euros goes to the artist you listen to because it's shared evenly. So it, it depends very much on how much each customer streams compared to another one. And it also means, for instance, if I listen to, uh, say, a favorite artist of mine um, uh, and I could listen one month I listen a hundred streams and the next one a uh, hundred streams but what they would get uh, of the money depends on what you are streaming so if you streamed a thousand one month then okay eight of my um, dollars would go to that if you stream two thousand streams the next month you know my even though I listen to the same amount to my uh, favorite artist the revenue they would see would drop the next month even lower. And what we tried to do was say, okay, how about distributing the same amount of money based on the customers, what they pay. So if you pay 10 euro, I pay 10 euros, your 10 euros would be distributed to the artists that you listen to or the labels, uh, and then from the labels to the artists. And if whether or not I listen one stream or a thousand, uh, my 10 euros would go to my artists. And so we did a calculation of, of those two models and we saw one of the, we didn't have any kind of uh, hypothesis how that would kind of uh, 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 differ between the two models. But one, one of the kind of interesting uh, effects we saw was that you would um, you would see a lot more money uh, the the month we looked at or the two months uh, we compared uh, they you would see about 13 percent growth for local artists in Norway that would be Norwegian artists uh, because they the, the 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 reason we think is that they kind of have developed a kind of loyalty over time people know them they follow their fans uh, favorite uh, artists that they maybe have a special relationship to. And uh, so, so you would see kind of a, a reshuffling of, of the money. Um, the three major labels would still have a major share. They would drop a bit. They would go from 76% uh, of the market uh, till 75%, 1 drop, 1% uh, point drop. But still, uh, you would see uh, the local artists within those three labels, they would get more while others would, would lose in, the, in a sense. And you would also see some changes when it comes to genre because, for instance, if, you, if, if every stream is priced the same way, then if I, say, listen to a lot of jazz or classical music, all the streams are much longer than, say, a pop tune, which means that you know, if, if I listen to an hour of music a day, uh, I listen to fewer streams because they each stream lasts longer. And that kind of uh, 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 way of um, uh, kind of uh, giving more to short songs, that, that, that would kind of uh, be evened out in a user-centric model because then the time I spend listening would be the same whether I listen to 10 or 100 streams. Did you get that? <laughs> It's a bit hard to explain, but yeah. Svanung, uh, <coughs> is it uh, the streaming services uh, job to uh, even out the money? Or is it someone else <coughs> that should do it? No, uh, it's not our job because we have uh, contracts with the record labels. Uh, so this uh, discussion has to be taken uh, at the record labels themselves. 
Uh, what we have done is to is to support uh, Arndt's uh, work uh, at um, at his project, and uh, we also kind of high fived your project uh, at South by Southwest uh, this year. Uh, but after that, we have kind of uh, let that discussion just uh, go uh, over to the record labels. Uh, take, for example, Universal Music, that uh, have both uh, Rihanna and uh, uh, Deutsche Grammophon in their catalog. I think there are some different voices within uh, the Universal Music system uh, that have to discuss um, the ups and downs of this model. Because uh, Rihanna is maybe one of those who are having a lot of uh, young people streaming a lot of music every month, while uh, there's um, uh, a lot of uh, classic in, uh, classical music uh, fans listening to few albums, making their time to sit down in the sofa and listen to a classical work from Deutsche Grammophon. And you can see, as Arndt told, that the money from this classical guy just passes over to the popular music field. So, yeah, they should discuss it, uh, and we are eager to see what they find out. I, I want to add one more fact. It's, I think it's, uh, it's fairly um, likely that the fan-artist relation will be much stronger if you know that the money you are paying for a subscription is actually going to the rights owner of the songs you're listening to, which will be, in very many cases, the artist you are listening to. So it would make a much better relation between the money you actually pay for something and the artist receiving the money. And I think that's a fact that also could probably contribute to the 1% of simulated loss now that could actually grow for the local artists of the major companies. I agree, and I also think that it, it might be a way to build trust between consumers and artists. There is a lot of discussion, especially from artists, that think they receive too little from streaming. And uh, it's, a, they kind of, it's, a, it's, it's not a very transparent system. You, you don't always see, understand how uh, the money is distributed or why don't I get more and those things. And, and if you could build more transparency and build more trust into the, the, the economic model, I think it would both be good for the customers, the ones that are fans and the ones that pay a, a 10 euros a month or 20 for a hi-fi, uh, and also make artists that now are hesitant or li labels that are hesitant uh, in kind of adopting streaming, say, we don't want to, to lose money and we don't want to be in that catalog. If they see that they would get uh, money from their fans, maybe they would, uh, would uh, more e e easily put their catalog on the streaming services and making it available uh, for people to listen to. C can you see the, um, your presentation of the user-centric model? Is it online somewhere? So yeah, sure. Uh, if, you, if you Google clouds and concerts, you, you'll get the, uh, the, the page, home page of our, uh, or you could get, go to cloudsandconcerts.com and you could come to our university project uh, page and there's a, a page for publications and it's right on top there if you want to look at it. Now I'm also presenting uh, later this afternoon if you haven't fallen asleep uh, at 5.30, I'm also presenting some and showing uh, some slides from, from that particular presentation then. Uh, Svanung, uh, where do, uh, do the record labels stand on this issue today? And one more thing, um, is the back catalogs uh, uh, also a big uh, competition for the indie artists uh, in the streaming world? Are they taking a lot of uh, revenue? I'm not sure if I'm the one to answer on that. Uh, I don't know the, the flow between uh, back catalog and the new music uh, too well. Uh, but I know, yeah, uh, the feedback on this uh, user-centric model has been uh, that all the labels says it's very interesting. They want to study it more, learn more. Uh, but as everyone thinks that it's the streaming services who have to find that, this out, they are also very quiet on this. So. Uh, yeah, I think it's actually the artists and the artist organization have to drag 
a bit to get something done here if they want something. Uh, <clears throat> what um, we talked about the streaming model, how it works today, uh, and especially in Norway. Uh, what parts of the streaming success in Norway is transferable to new markets, especially Europe? Um, I think I think the full uh, experience of a streaming service being available all the time, not being very techy, uh, that you, ha uh, you buy new stuff in, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what it's called here, Media Markt maybe, uh, uh, that you buy new equipment and you just log on to your streaming service. You buy a new phone, it's easy to uh, download an app, easy to use. I think all, all uh, kind of uh, borders that fell out and it makes it easier and more convenient and more available. I think streaming in few years should be uh, one of the main uh, inco main uh, income uh, in the record industry all over Europe. Um, yeah. Aren't? Um, I think, of course, it depends on, on uh, the, the economics and uh, if uh, customers can afford uh, to pay for music. Um, but I also agree with having kind of the basic infrastructure and having it easily available. Uh, I think we'll, uh, we'll see a lot of um, other countries <coughs> having the same growth as in Norway. Now the Norwegian growth has kind of leveled up, out because three out of four Norwegians are al already on streaming, so it's kind of uh, uh, slowing down. But for instance, in the US now, uh, last year they saw more than 30% growth in, in streaming, so it's, it's kind of a, the fastest growing uh, way of listening to music in the States as well, even though they're very f low still when it comes to streaming uh, compared to uh, both sales and, uh, and, and digital downloads. Uh, but when you see that uh, the great success of, of Netflix and video streaming in the US, I think that that might kind of uh, provide a back door to music streaming because uh, so many uh, households in the US now have Netflix and see that it's a very easy, convenient way to access everything they want or a lot of things they want to, to, to look at. And with music, it's even the catalog is kind of uh, almost uh, comprehensive. You don't have Beatles and you don't have a couple of other great uh, uh, artists that you would want to see there, but you still have 25 million tracks to, to choose from. So it's, it's almost everything there compared to, for instance, Netflix uh, and HBO, which have their kind of separate catalogs. I would like to add that if the alternative is uh, piracy, then uh, there's no way without going through um, streaming, which is uh, a better product than piracy. You need a better product to compete with piracy, and uh, streaming has shown, at least in Norway and Sweden and Denmark, very good um, uh, com competitive forces compared to the piracy. When uh, in 2009, iPred was implemented in uh, Sweden, and that was one year after Spotify launched, and you can see the curves for piracy going down while streaming is going up. Uh, as I said earlier, not that clear picture in Norway because of what we had earlier, the download market was strong, but we can see also in Norway, piracy go down and streaming goes up. So it's, it's the same tendency, I'd say. So you would say that uh, it's not um, campaigns against uh, piracy that, uh, reduced uh, piracy in Scandinavia, but, m but uh, launching of uh, better products? Uh, there's been big discussions about that, and I tend to lean on the foot that says um, um, it's not uh, pointing your finger to the consumer that helps, it's building the relation and uh, helping the consumer find a good product and trusting it. Okay, uh, <clears throat> uh, we talked about the uh, streaming model uh, today. Um, so is this a um, model for the future? Uh, and what dangers lies ahead for the streaming model when it's going to be launched in new countries? Shall I go first? Yes. Yeah. Well, um, 
the the I, I think the streaming model is is gonna survive and be part of our um, music consumption future. Um, what we see as an indie player in the field, we are like uh, fine tunes in Germany. We are that in uh, in uh, the Nordics, and what we see is this is now a big player's game. Uh, we talk to Google, Spotify. We talk to really big international multi big companies and small players they need to have negotiation power to um, cope with that and that's why we are organized through Merlin which we think is the exact answer to that challenge but um, that's one of the, the dangers in in uh, the music industry today um, the domination from few players um, if you follow the YouTube debate and uh, the AIM and um, Impala, um, Merlin uh, sayings on that, it's very interesting to see and I, I hope that the future can uh, understand and fully appreciate all the innovation and development of music as a field that happens in the indie sector with artists going to studios, making new music and driving things forward. I was at the AIM conference now in London before coming here and all of the new trends, everything happening within um, the change of music and the constantly innovation in music, it comes from the Indies. So um, uh, it would be a bad thing to cut them out of, uh, of the payment loop. Svanung, so, will uh, the future be 100% uh, uh, digital? No, uh, I don't think so. I, I'm, a, I'm still a big uh, physical fan myself. Uh, I buy vinyls and CDs and uh, box sets and everything. Uh, I, got, I get them signed by artists I meet. Uh, I'm a music fan. And I guess there will always be music lovers who, who need that kind of merchandise. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's trust the, or let's uh, support uh, record stores, not only in, on the record store day then. Um, what I wanted to say is that what makes this very exciting uh, is that the culture of music has some kind of substance that uh, pass actually the fact that we are now seeing this multi big companies around the world, Spotify, Google, YouTube, uh, you could mention a lot of them. If you go through the last 100 years of music history, you can always see trends uh, um, in all periods, uh, even from the 20s, uh, 1920s, that you will have first innovators, then you have the mainstream period, and then you have what we called in the 70s punk period, where you have the niches and stuff. And I guess we are now going from being innovators to get into a mainstream period and I'm really looking forward to the punk period. <laughs> uh, I'd like to add uh, a couple of things. I think, for, first of all, I'm, uh, I think streaming will uh, grow and will become a very important uh, way of accessing and listening to music. But I still think there are some uh, things that are not perfect with the system and, and which kind of poses threats and which could kind of be uh, worked out in a better way. One is the kind of distribution that I, I talked about and, and the implications that that uh, distribution of money has. For instance, uh, it, it means that it's very hard to, to plan and it's, it's hard, for instance, if I, uh, uh, if I released a, a band, uh, I would be very dependent on what my friend on the second row here listened to and if he released a band that same month, that was huge. Uh, uh, because my uh, revenue from the uh, artist I release is dependent on what other people are listening to and what other releases are coming. I mean, if Rihanna releases a record together with Justin Bieber and uh, Elvis comes back, you know, it doesn't really matter what you do and how perfect your album is because everyone will listen to that. So it's it, the, 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 the problem with uh, with um, planning and, and, uh, and being able to 
to know in advance uh, what happens with your uh, fans and how they will influence it. That's that's a knot that we'll have to solve in a sense, and which also plays into the liquidity challenge that now you only get money from past listening, not from future listening. When you buy an album, you kind of give everything up front uh, for what you will listen to in the future, but with streaming, it depends on what you have listened to. So it takes longer to build, uh, to get money back from an album. So that's also hard. And the third challenge, I think, is, is uh, that we see from streaming patterns and also uh, reports, for instance, by Mark Mulligan shows that uh, it now appears that streaming um, leads to concentration. So the, the largest 1% of artists get an uh, even higher share of all the money um, compared to earlier. And I don't think that's good when it comes to innovation, as uh, Trun said. I think we uh, uh, need to work out ways so also small acts, innovative acts, uh, can get uh, revenue back. And I, I think that's... Uh, uh, hard nut to, to, to crack uh, when it comes to the concentration. And I don't know why. Maybe it's because of the streaming model, the pro rata model, maybe that contributes to it. Or maybe it, it also is kind of network effects that it's really hard to, to come through the clutter and, and, uh, and, and it's a hard competition for attention these days. Uh, and maybe that the network's effect that we see with people talking and people sharing things online and social media, maybe that contributes to the concentration in, in a sense. Uh, will the digital future look the same all over the world uh, or will, it, um, will the streaming model uh, look different in different parts of the world? I can just start a little bit. Uh, there's a very interesting uh, research project going on in, in Cambridge where they look at uh, different uh, um, uh, markets. And, and, and it's so uh, interesting to see how many different ways of accessing music there are in India, in uh, South America, in Europe, uh, etc. And I think it shows that people will access and use music in very different ways also in the future. In, in you know parts of of Asia, people are trading uh, SIM cards with the music loaded up. Uh, of course, none of this uh, is a, a, in a, a white economy; it's a black economy. But that you know, having everything on a chip also could be a possible future when uh, when storage capacity is larger. Maybe you when you get the phone from Apple, you get the Beats tracks uh, on it, and then with the subscription service on top of that. There are many possible ways of seeing kind of different combinations between models also connected with the physical sales, of course. And I think those models will, will vary across uh, the world uh, as uh, other media consumption patterns varies today. Um, um, just a comment. Uh, um, yeah. uh, when uh, yeah, uh, last year was this um, conference in Africa called Africa.com and uh, what, what is the main thing they talk about is how um, internet is going, going to be mobile and um, mobile handsets is going to be the carrier of everything, also music. So I think like we will see leapfrogging in, in terms of how, um, what kind of instruments that will be doing the digital um, uh, carrying of music. I, I think also it, it, you have to build flexible systems if you want to take the whole world. And I, that, uh, by saying that, I don't think there will be one company ruling the developments uh, around the world. Um, I think if we would focus on Pakistan or, uh, and Bang Bangladesh, we, we can't focus on Africa at the same time. So uh, yeah, uh, I, I just think you have to pick the markets. <laughs> And I can't really see that Spotify or YouTube will, will do that in that sense, but uh, it, it's exciting to see. No, they, there's, there's new startups also in Africa, and uh, yeah. they think totally different around what we are thinking. Yeah. So it's, it's going to be very exciting. I think it's I think. maybe m probably more that you have startups within these countries making things that are uh, going to, to work for them there and then going to be bought up from these large companies. Yeah. So, yeah. 
But there's uh, another challenge as well in this uh, in Africa and Asia, and that's um, the record industry is not working no. <laughs> the same way as we are used to in uh, the US and Europe. Mm. And uh, we're starting to get broadband, uh, especially in China. Um, but still, uh, what do you think will be, um, when we have uh, the opportunity to launch, uh, but uh, not um, uh, the record labels to work with, uh, what will, uh, how will you uh, solve that? When are you going to la launch Tidal in Asia? <laughs> I don't know. We haven't we haven't got any plans for China right now. Uh, I don't know the market there as well. But I I, uh, I guess it will be hard work before we can go there. We used to have one of the companies I worked with, uh, Arts Pages, used to have a subsidiary in in China, and it took very much time to work with the Music Corporate Society of China in order to implement everything we needed to distribute music there. And um, one of the things we saw actually working was. Uh, traditional songs streamed through Real Rhapsody in the US. That was the diaspora of Chinese um, people living there, wanting to uh, fresh up old memories, I guess. Um, they listened to all kinds of pop music, but also military marches and uh, very traditional music. But uh, we, never, we never really put our focus on uh, those territories. Obviously, it's going to be uh, the, the middle class of China is going to be as huge as uh, big parts of Europe in, when it comes to the, the consumption power. So it will be a future market for music, I'm absolutely sure. Last question. Uh, do you think uh, in 10 years will there be streaming services uh, available in uh, every part of the world? Yeah, almost. Aren't these are everywhere? <laughs> uh, but there will be kind of, uh, I don't say white label solutions, but you have this, we're in all countries, but you, you, I don't think you find one company that actually has an organization in every country doing operation within that country. So it's more like it's open on the internet and you can buy it from everywhere. Uh, I think the world is quite big yet. Yeah. <laughs> I believe it will, and I think that uh, what you see when people are used to having things streamed, either music or video, it's hard to go back to, to a previous model. And so I think it will spread gradually, but not, maybe not uh, evenly all, the, all over the world. I don't think that, but I think it will be available. Trun, you want the last word? Um, yeah, I tend to think the same, um, um, that it will be differing from territory to territory, but the streaming as such, once you've tasted it and started using it, it represents something really special in terms of you can always access the music you are thinking of or talking about, you can share it with friends. Um, it has met a new need for how you use music, and I think that, will, that need will continue to exist. Yes, um, we have uh, two or three minutes left, so if anyone have a question, it's uh, <coughs> possible to do that now. Uh, yes? Hi. Thank you for the nice presentation. Um, I was on a presentation earlier today by Paul uh, Rosnikoff from Digital Musical News, and he was talking about 30 most insidious persuasive lies about the modern music industry. And one of those lies was that uh, Spotify is not your friend. And the reason why he said it is because you have some artists that have been streamed, say, three million times, and they get like $40 for it. So it's not really working for the artists. It's a little bit working towards artists. So my first question is, how is the money distributed? So if, for example, Spotify or Wimp gets $100 in revenue, how much of that money actually goes to the artists or to the record label or to within the company? How is the money distributed? Second thing is um, I love streaming services. I think it's genius because it simplifies things and I can listen to music wherever I am. But if there would be an option where say that I could use a streaming service that gave more money to the artists, then I would switch in a blink. But I'm just wondering why, why haven't we come further? Why isn't it a player like Netflix 
within the music industry, which actually invest billions in producing new stuff, bringing up creativity, bringing up new, I don't know, series and stuff. Oh. Who Thank wants you. to start? You? Yeah, I, can, I can start with the first question. Um, and I can only answer from a WIMP perspective. Uh, we pay out uh, about 75%, sometimes up to 80% of all income back to uh, all labels. Uh, so how the money is spread from the labels to the artist depends on the artist's contracts. Um, what's average? Uh, I'm not sure about that. I, I think some artists have 10%, 20%. Uh, I remember cup, maybe last year, February last year, uh, Beggars Group said that they are now giving 50% back to all their artists, including Adele, uh, which is a quite high rate. Uh, I'm, I'm not the one to decide what's correct. I mean, uh, Arndt's point about uh, the production costs uh, use longer time to get uh, back because of the um, you get paid after the streams, after the sales, instead of before the streams when you bought the CD. Um, the, the record labels also have to be strengthened in some way, but yeah, of course the artists should be paid a lot from those 75 to 80 percent. I don't know that um, example of three million tracks getting $4. Uh, I, I'm not sure about streaming numbers in big territories like America and stuff. If you get three million streams in Norway, at least, then you get a great payout. I'd just like to add, there's, a, there's an interesting article issued yesterday about uh, uh, interviews with managers and uh, label managers about this issue in the Music Ally, if you read that magazine. Okay. Cool. It came yesterday. Aren't? Um, just the point, where you mentioned Netflix and, the, and that they're making their own stuff. Uh, an important difference there is that they do that uh, as a way of um, becoming exclusive, uh, of course. And, and in some, some ways, you see the same things with streaming music. For instance, WIMP, they release a lot of exclusive commentary tracks for albums. Say, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Robin, uh, the artist, Swedish artist, uh, when she released her bo three albums, The Body Talk, part one, two, three, after she had re uh, released all those, she, she came with an exclusive album on, on uh, WIMP where she, re she commented the production process, what she was thinking, all those things, just as you would see in a DVD commentary track. And so that, that is an example of people doing things like that. Or you would have other examples from Wimp or other where they, where they actually make new albums. For instance, from the Oya Festival in Norway, they put art, two artists together playing uh, each other's songs or other things. Uh, you could probably say more about that, but that is kind of exclusively released within that streaming service again. So you see examples like that. As for the numbers, I was just reading about uh, Calvin Harris. He's got the most streamed song during the three summer months. And they it's 160 million streams. And they, um, um, it's, this is, I think, uh, the bulletin, the Musical Eye Building's uh, prediction that this gives him about $1.2 uh, million. Dollars. I think our time is up, uh, so uh, on behalf of the panel and myself, thank you for uh, listening and have a good day.